From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi, and welcome to another John Hannah Meets. Today is a rather special show. We're going to celebrate the life of Leslie Grantham, one of the nicest guys I ever met in my 44 years as an interviewer. So, we're going back to 2008, when I met him backstage at the Devonshire Park Theatre, Eastbourne. <laughs> Another Hannam Archive. Nice to see you again, Leslie. And you, John. It's always a great buzz to chat to you because you've been there, you've done it. Uh, yeah, well, and also have you, you know. I mean, we, I think we go back quite a while now, don't we? We do. And the exciting thing is you're currently touring in Dad's Army Marches On. I know you're enjoying it, aren't you? Love it, love it. I rate you, Leslie Grantham, as still the most famous soap star of them all. Well, I know you're very modest. Very but... kind of you. I mean, it. It's, it's, I was very lucky, I was very lucky. I was given a, a terrific part to play, written wonderfully, created by Julia Smith and Tony Holland, who are sadly no longer with us. But uh, I do think uh, yeah, I was just lucky. And I think, well, I've been, think I've been lucky yeah, with a lot of things in my life, so that's fine. Christmas Day 1986. Yeah. You uttered three words, didn't you? <laughs> Go on, and just do them once more, will you? Go on. <laughs> oh, uh, happy Christmas, Ange, yeah. 30 million. Yeah, not bad. I wish it was pounds, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> they get excited now, don't they? 10 million, 12 million. 20 million watched that talent show. 30 million saw you that day. Yeah, well, again, it, that's the beauty, I think, of of doing the show then. Because although we were only twice a week and with the uh, omnibus on a Sunday, what happens now when... Because when, people say to me all the time, why don't you get back in and sort them out? I say, I've been killed. I say, no, we don't care. The audience doesn't care. What and, and that's a sad indictment of four or five episodes a week because the storylines come around quickly. The, the, the quality of the writing can't be as good, and the quality of the acting and, and all that cannot be as good because they're under so much pressure now. When you're doing two shows a, a week, you've got the luxury of rehearsing properly. You've got the luxury of the directors of being able to try things out, and I think I think the audience at the moment is being shortchanged uh, because there's nothing to look forward to. I used to remember walking back from the local station, a tube station, to where I lived in Fulham, uh, and suddenly I'd think, wow. And I could all I could hear was the EastEnders theme because it would be that time of night. Now people, and people were rushing home, so we'll never miss it. And you're not getting that because it's... It's too much. It's about like having too much, too much icing on a Christmas cake. You know, it, it becomes a little bit sickly after a while, doesn't it? I mean, it's the same in your business, John. You know, if you were to play the same records every time you're on there, people go, yeah, yeah, he is great. Yeah, John's great. But mm, I wish he'd find something a bit different. When you look back, over half the British population watched that particular Christmas. Didn't yeah, it? and that week, I mean, I think it worked out with the, with the omnibus and the... Um, because it was shown in the afternoon and the evening, and, and then again, I think 84 million people watched it, which is like, in those, I think it was 27 million more than it was in the country. I know we had a lot of illegal immigrants at the time, but I don't think we had that many. <laughs> We're in Eastbourne, one of my favourite places. Yeah, love it, yeah. I like Eastbourne because when I walk along, Leslie, most people are older than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I do. I, I, it's something about this, this neck of the woods that I do actually love, whether it's, whether it's Worthing, or Eastbourne, you've got the Sussex Downs, you've got the sea. I'm not a great, I'm going to upset a lot of people, I'm not a great lover of Brighton. I wouldn't like to live in Brighton. You were a mob there many years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right, on the beach, yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't like to, I don't know, it, it's, it's, and when I first came to Eastbourne, it was, it was a little bit run down, and they've spent a fortune with the, replacing the groins, they've done some lovely, put some decking out on the beaches down there where you can sit and have a coffee. I think of the two places in this neck of the woods that I really do like, it's Eastbourne and Worthing, but my heart, believe it or not, is, is Worthing. I want to live in Worthing. If, I think eventually if I, you know, if, I, if I live long enough to get to that age where I need sheltered accommodation, I think Worthing is the place I want to be. The mobility scooters, they're sportier there. You know. Can I just say, since we last met, I've read your book. And oh, it's, it's very kind Fantastic. Of One of the best reads I've had for ages because you being you, you're very honest. And 
it was just a, a fascinating read, really. Well, it's very kind. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I did it as sort of as a sort of therapy, really, of thinking, well, that's those monkeys off me back. It doesn't work. It just just means that people, I think, if they're going to buy the book and they want to find out about me and what I am and who I am and how I am, and uh, then they'll probably get a bit of insight into it. And a lot of people have said. Um, the same sort of words that you did that they they found it fascinating and I was very brave to write it but I couldn't write anything that wasn't the truth really so uh, I, I did okay for a guy who uh, who can't write that's fine it's an amazing story really because if you hadn't shouted from the rain yeah on that one particular day when you sort of got inspired to join the army wonder what you'd have been doing now uh possibly uh painting and decorating yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's odd, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and and I've been very lucky. You know, we we talked uh, briefly uh, before we were on air about um, certain people, and in my life, I've met some fantastic people, and one of them was this guy we just talked about, Shep Woolley, mm. who, you know, when I was in uh, in sort of the Portsmouth way, he he gave up his time to come in and entertain us poor lads, and um, you know, and I always get up every now and again, so I was always bumped into Shep Woolley, says hello, you might not remember, well, he might not remember me, but uh, I have uh, a lot of affection for a lot of people in the, in the, in that sort of, in the, especially in the, the, the Portsmouth area, who came in and gave their time, um, and in fact, a, um, a couple were, been coming to see me in shows for years, and sadly, uh, Keith and Christine, sadly, Keith died last year, uh, but Christine still keeps in touch, and she's coming. To, I know she's coming to Fairham to see the show. But so it's very nice that I must have, I must have made done something right that some people remember me and remember me with affection. In a way, the army changed your life forever for several different reasons. Really, yeah. I know. Obviously, you went to prison, which has been well chronicled. And in a strange way, um, you obviously did your time joining that drama group, Leslie, in prison. Really. Gave you an incentive, didn't it? Yeah, I just think it's, you know, because I, I think I'd always wanted to be a performer and, and anybody who's sort of a certain age will remember when things like Clark Brothers were on the, the, the Sunday night. Oh, the, I remember the, them, yeah. yeah. I used to want to emulate them and slide across the floor, you yeah. know, drive my parents mad. And uh, n- and no one really, um, apart from uh, Michael Caine, I suppose, who sort of came from um, a council estate in those days and went to drama school until... Um, John Osborne uh, brought his plays out. So I used to lie and say I was going to watch football on a Saturday afternoon, though I'm football mad. And I'd sneak off to the new theatre in Bromley and um, or the little theatre in Bromley and watch a show. And then I'd get the evening paper because you used to get a Saturday sports paper then. And I'd say, to them, oh, you've been in the match because I'd be reading the review and because one day I got called out because I only had an half-time review. So, yeah, no. Um, and then joining um, joining the drama group in Wormer Scrubs and then subsequently going to Kingston prison in Portsmouth there and then uh, eventually well, I ended up in, in Lay Hill in Gloucester and that uh, did give me the incentive and people saw saw something in me that they they said they encouraged me to to become an actor I haven't I haven't been found out yet so I'm still getting away with it yet. twice in your life you, you you were really at a low ebb weren't you once I know you thought about suicide in another occasion you you took pills and you've come through which is Fantastic, really, Leslie, isn't it? Well, I think I've been very lucky. I've been sort of surrounded by good mates and good family and that. And um, But, yeah, I think a cry for help sometimes is, is the only way we can deal with things. And, um, sadly, um, a lot of people haven't had the assist or the help that I've had. And David Scarborough, for once, who was in EastEnders, who played the original Mark Fowler, Sadly, he couldn't cope with uh, things and, and threw himself off Beachy Head, which isn't far from here, mm. obviously. Um, and, and I'm sure that... Um, I think it's the way society's going, isn't it, that we, we seem to be more obsessed about the wrong things and, and, and we're encouraged to be obsessed about the wrong things, whether it's money or, or whatever. And cries for help, they land on deaf ears, don't they? And, and a lot of people end up uh, tragically losing their lives I was at a low ebb several times and, and but I I managed to and maybe someone was telling me not to do it maybe someone said uh, oh don't be silly um, and uh, it was that uh, there were unseen eyes that um, that had heard my cry but you know when you've got a good family when you've got good friends that's what helps you through I know there was a petition from the prison officers just before we leave the subject and they were on your side weren't they which is 
encouraging for you, wasn't it? Yeah, because I mean, I was. I think I was always a bit of a uh, a square peg in a round hole, uh, having come from the army and going to uh, into a, um, a civilian establishment. If you like, they're not quite sure of 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 you, and then obviously because. Um, I was in, got involved with the drama group, and no one who was straight got involved with the drama group. I think they thought, "What's he up to?" And then I think gradually they they realised that um, that you know we're all the same, um, uh, and we all have different ways that we want to get through things. And and I was fortunate that I actually found an avenue uh, which I'd always wanted to do, but never had the the, the balls, if you like, to to to, to do it. And I think in the end, you know, I had a lot of time for the people in, in, in Kingston um, Prison and, and the, some of the staff there were great. I mean, it, there's always this them and us. It's never them and us. There's always grey areas and there's always areas that um, people do go out of their way to, to help people. Um, so I think I've been very, very lucky, uh, again, that um, for some reason people whether it's members of the public, whether it's members of our industry or other people that you come in contact with who who see something decent in you. Last thing about prison, when you left, £17, 11p in your pocket. Yeah, You've done all right, haven't you? Yeah, I've got £17, 19p now, <laughs> yeah. so, so I've had a bit of a profit. If the Icelandic banks and the volcano hadn't gone off, I'd have a little bit more. You did a bit of painting and decorating because you said you probably would have followed that route which you did for a while and then you went to Weber Douglas of course didn't you? Yeah well I, I did the painting and decorating too I did the um, German embassy by day and the VD clinical <laughs> by night paid me basically uh, paid my way through drama school for two years and then um, when, when, I, when I was at drama school and it got heavier in the fact that we were working Saturdays and late at night um, the, the college sort of uh, found, um, you know, I ended up cleaning the place and I would do, so they they knew that I would really want to be it and um, be an actor and and so I used to clean clean the college every day and then during the uh, the breaks um, I'd go in and paint it and revamp it, you know, really chart it up. So, yeah, so I was very, like, again, the, the principal, um, uh, Rafe Jago, who sadly Weber Douglas is no longer here, it's just merged with Central or has been sold to Central. I think he... I think he thought, well, this guy wants to do it and he's got no money, he hasn't got much, so I'll find work for him to do. So I used to assist in the office when the term broke up or I'd, I'd earn money um, showing the auditionees through. So, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been very lucky. Looking back, you've done some amazing things because I know you didn't have an equity card, did you, which was you were going to go into Jake's End. Really. Yeah, that's right, yeah. You didn't have an equity card, well, which was uh, tough going, really, wasn't it, for you? Yeah, but I think it was probably, I think it was probably someone saying... Uh, yeah, it's all very nice to be offered the second lead in a in a film, a TV film, the first day, you know, your first job. But maybe uh, it's another way of someone saying, "No, hold on, get a smaller part," and then and then because from the smaller part, I got taken to India and Jewel and the Crown by the same director. So it all works itself out. You know? I know you worked in a greengrocer's in a in a very designer conscious clothes shop, didn't you? Yeah, well, I think you have to, don't you? You just can't. You know, out of all the kids who were at drama school with me, I, I think I've been the um, the luckiest. Is that there was another girl, Linda Henry, who uh, took a while to sort of really take off, but she she did Bad Girls, and she's now in EastEnders. I think she's Shirley in EastEnders, but it took her a while. But, um, yeah, there are a lot more talented people than me who were probably sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring and then become disillusioned. If you've got something to do while you're waiting for the phone to ring, then you don't look so hungry when you go in for the job. You actually made your professional acting debut, I'm from the Isle of Wight, as you know, just across the water we have Portsmouth and yeah. we have Southampton. Yeah. I think it was Southampton where you started very With Jake's you? End, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was great, yeah. But we had a, we had a few problems with that uh, show. I turned up and I was in this hotel and they kept saying, you're called it. So, so, so me being keen, we'd be up at the crack of dawn uh, waiting, 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 and then nothing, nothing. And then suddenly at night time we did the scene and it seems that a member of the cast had gone in and upset some someone in a shop or something. Um, and then they sort of lost the location. So, yeah, but in the end, hey, it's um, it's it's. Uh, I've been very lucky. You know, I, I, I learnt a lot at Kingston Drama uh, Group and uh, I learnt a lot on that first job at Southampton. So maybe... I shouldn't think about Worthing. Maybe I should think about moving to the Isle of Wight.
<laughs> there was a lovely story in the book when you went for an audition to play a prisoner and you didn't get it. I didn't it, get did it, you? no, no, that's it. I was, didn't look anything like a prisoner at all. <laughs> Is it a fact that you were almost went into Coronation Street? I was offered, uh, yeah, I was asked to be um, Bette Lynch's boyfriend. In, in it. It was a pile of Jeffrey yeah, Hughes. Yeah, Jeff lives on the Isle of Wight. Yeah, it was a pile of Jeffrey Hughes. He was also going to be a prisoner, but uh, I decided that uh, I didn't re- really want to be in a in a soap opera. Uh, and it was by the same guy who directed Doctor Who. Yeah, you were in that, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, and then he, 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 was, he recommended me for EastEnders, but although Julia Smith and Tony Holland used to teach at Webber Douglas, they used to teach television, and she had originally said to me one day, have you got an equity card? I went, no. Why? Oh, she said, oh, there's a part for you in Angels. And, oh, and so I'm glad I didn't get that because then I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been uh, the iconic character. And... Exactly. Going back to Jeff Hughes, I've, I've seen a picture in your book of three of you dressed uh, up as women. Yeah, well, two, well, possibly one of the nicest guy I've ever, ever met in my life, sadly, no longer with us, Don Henderson, who... Uh, he, um, I did a Bullman before EastEnders. That was through luck because um, an actor who was playing the part broke his leg playing football. And Jim O'Brien, who, who directed me in Jake's End and then uh, Jewel in the Crown, said, Oh, I know a guy, phoned me up and said, What was I doing? And we were just about to go to America for a holiday to visit my brother in law on his honeymoon. That not a, you know, it wasn't a two week honeymoon, it was a sort of a longer one. and uh, and a thing called the People's Express, if anyone remembers that, which was the original sort of budget airline. And um, I said, I don't know. And I said to my wife, Are we, um, what are we doing? She said, Why? I said, Well, there's this part in Granada. Oh, no, if, they, if you get, I can go on my own. She said, I could see David on my own. And um, so I said, Yeah, I can do it. And then he said, Hold on. And in 10 minutes, he said, Can you get the train? I said, Can I? So I was there, up there, ready to go. So, and that's how I met Don. And then Don became a great mate. And then he, when I was doing a, a personal appearance in Coventry Way, I think it was, Don turned up and said, uh, oh, great to see you. And then I was we were doing a thing together for Pat Phoenix uh, just after she died. And Don suddenly turned up and said, oh, I really want to work with you again, mate. And next two days later, he phoned up and said, oh, why don't you meet Murray Smith? And he'd come up with this idea of the Paradise Club. So... Yeah. Yeah, and then and then when we did Children in Need, there was you know Pretty Boy in the middle as the Andrews sisters, and there That's was it. Jeffrey and uh, and Don. No, I, I couldn't be a woman. I couldn't wear those stockings. <laughs> and they made us wear stockings and suspenders. Put that light out. I'm trying to relax and listen to John Hannum. I'm with Leslie Grantham in uh, Eastbourne. Uh, not far from your mob days on Brighton Seafront. Oh, there, yeah. I can, oh, when I listen to all those stories now, where, and how it was all set up, it was all set up by the for the papers. Just that thing. We load of us had gone down just for the day, like we did, and because a load of other ones turned up, and so you know, everyone give you free drinks if you go and run at each other on the thing, you know. And we stopped halfway across and helped some woman, the young woman was struggling to go up the steps with a pushchair so that's how bad it was so again it's sort of uh, yeah but Brighton in those days was uh, there was the sort of places that you you went to no one came to Eastbourne no one went to Eastbourne no one went to Worthing no one went to Hove which are beautiful parts of the thing because it had that old Mm. feel about it you know know, I'm not being derogatory I'm not being derisory because I but when you're in your kids, everyone, Brighton, it's like, or South End, they're the places that you wanted to go to uh, because that's all you ever heard about. And then you say, well, why don't we go to um, Bogner Regis? Or why don't we go, to, oh, no, you don't want to go there. It's full of old people. <laughs> now I'm an old person. I want to come to old. Yes. I think it's all part of the way we're brainwashed in, in what to do when we're, we're young. Our formative years are all, we're all, and because television was new, wasn't it? Yeah. So basically, um, although it's been around since the 30s, but um, we get all our information. Uh, now it's easy because everyone's on in the internet on, and we, there's more, at the, more and more newspapers and magazines and, and that to read. But when you're spoon-fed dribs and drabs, you think, oh, yeah, that's where I want to go. We wouldn't have been talking about Pete the Barrel Boy about... No, I don't, know, I don't think so. 20 no. years after no. EastEnders, but Den Watts, of course, still talked about passionately by people that... Well, well I was very lucky to get that part because I did go up and read for Pete, the Barrow Boy, but I couldn't say Tweakle. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but you got they offered you well you didn't really want to stay for too long did you no initially? i didn't know but the interesting thing that um that Derek martin who plays charlie in uh eastenders now was also one of the original choices for den was he yeah because he, peter dean and and Derek martin did a, a a series for the bbc called law and order which was a three-parter and it was um the prisoner's towel, the policeman's towel, and the lawyer's towel, and it was um, uh, Ken, someone I can't remember his surname, sort of quirky uh, actor, who played the solicitors, um, and that that was a sort of an impro thing, and that was a very very successful, very much for Peter and very much for Derek Martin, and um, and then Peter from that got uh, the part of Elsie Tanner's truck driver boyfriend in Coronation Street. They built the calf for him. So we could meet her. And Derek Martin did a a, a series about, um, I think it was King's Castle or something like that for for ITV. And there was a, there was talk of those two playing, you know, Pete and 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 Den. And it was only because I think I walked in and that Julia and Tony remembered me from drama school. Also, they saw me as not the atypical publican. Mm. Most publicans on television are rather rotund. Yeah. And although. In the business, there are a lot of thin, uh, skinny uh, publicans, but television sometimes does go for the um, for the obvious and misses the obvious. So I was just lucky. You became a household name, and and everybody wanted to talk to you, wanted a part of you, and I suppose you you realised eventually somebody would unearth your past. Did you expect that, or not really? Um, I, well, I wasn't. I just think I just naive about everything, you know. Um, of course, you you. You f- you forget that there's a lot of people who uh, sometimes do things from uh, from an innocent sort of point of view. Some um, and then obviously a lot of people do it for financial gains, and it's become more and more pr- uh, prolific now, isn't it? For people to make money out of people, st- you know, we're going to get it with with the um, election, aren't we? You know, mm. the minute um, someone's uh, leading in the polls someone's going to be dishing the dirt and because in the end it doesn't suit certain people and certain businesses in this in this country to have um anything other than the um than the safe bet when the press are after you like they were with you did it really get you on occasions leslie or yeah it did i mean it did i think i think i'm people always think oh he's tough skinned he can do this he can get away you know you're not you know it's a veneer that you have to put on and um uh it's more about the pressures that your family and friends are under and and at the same time you you do become paranoid because you don't trust anybody you because things get into the papers you think well who did i say that to who knows about that and because accountants were selling story post office engineers were selling stories you know come they were tapping the phone and so and then you know when my oldest son was born we were under siege for four days and in the end the poor poor kid had to be you know that when the district nurse came around she just said uh give him a dummy it's no you'd never be able to breastfeed the poor kid so you do you do and and it's become even more now you know you you suddenly have got anybody can be a come a paparazzi so anybody with a camera mm. and there's no there's no uh, you don't have to with the, all these digital cameras you don't have to know how to work it you just all you know at the you just press a button and it it self focuses it so anyone can sell photographs of anyone and uh, you know people say oh, anybody can act yeah anybody can act but you you've got to sustain that level of um, excellence, if you like, to survive. It's like people say, oh, anyone could play music on the radio, you know, switch a button. Yeah, but it's no good just having non-stop music. The audience wants to listen to someone talking. You know, you wouldn't want to be stuck in a lift for 24 hours with music, would you? Not at all. No, no. you want to leave. you wouldn't mind if, you were, if there's someone else to talk to. And that's... That's sadly is 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 another thing of way we're we're going downhill if you like in in every part of our industry because it's all become you know it's all can become computerized digitalized and look at films you know you don't need to employ four hundred extras anymore you employ forty and have them yeah I know it's all this you know computer generated images and 
and I look at all the old black and white movies that I was I grew up on and, and the people that I fell in love with on, on, on the big screen and what they achieved with what limited resources they had, although they were they were the top of the range at the time, was phenomenal. And and now everything's so they're going to make a, they're, well they're making films now where there won't be any actors in it at all they'll just be commu- computer generated images Avatar uh, if you like is what half and half it's a hybrid but someone will bring out film where it will be basically a, a cartoon that's been that's and the, the characters will look three dimensional and they will look like John Wayne or they will look like Tom Cruise or, or whoever so Sadly, yeah, and they do it with music, don't they? How many how many things are, are are all you know? There's a lot of the stuff now. It's all on a you press a button and the and the, the backing track is already there. Should you have left EastEnders and should you have gone back? Really? Uh, yeah, I should have left and I should have gone back. But I, uh, sadly, the reason I went back was the fact is that, and it's still a, it's a terrible thing to have to say, and it sounds like I'm being very big headed. I'm not. Unfortunately, Dem Watts was bigger than the show. It became unbearable for me, uh, who is a guy who's very lucky, who comes from a very simple background and a very uh, uh, troubled background, to perform when I'm continually under pressure, under siege from the press. There wasn't a, I think there was two days when I wasn't on the front cover of any newspaper. And that's when Prince Andrew got engaged to Fergie and when Terry Wogan was called Old Big Ed. And both... Um, and I wrote to uh, Fergie and um, Andy and congratulated them on their thing and said, thanks for getting me off. And they wrote me a letter back and said, any time. Oh, and, nice. Fer- and then um, Wogan phoned me up and said, see, I've knocked you off the front page. Um, and, you know, you- so I didn't leave because I wanted to go on and do bigger and better things. I just felt that I, I just... And it was also a detriment to the show because it was causing some... A lot of, uh, not a lot, but there was a bit of animosity that the fact that acts think, why is he getting all this? Why is he getting all that? And uh, and it wasn't as if I was courting it. And then that, because actors were then thinking, well, I, I'm going to start getting some publicity. So they would, they would come up with things and the press weren't interested in it. So I left and I was very lucky. I got um, a mini series in Scotland. The day I was actually driving back from Dartmoor Prison where we'd been filming, to say they want they want to be play this boxing uh, promoter, and then straight after that I got Paradise Club, and then um, you did Cluedo, Fortboy. Oh yeah, and all that stuff. So I've yeah. been very very lucky, and then I was asked to go back because they wanted to kill the Watts family off. If you will kill Dem Watts off completely, uh, and it hasn't worked. Although there's no Watts family in... Will you ever go back, do you think? If they asked me again, I'd go back, but I'd have... This time I'd say I want better scripts. I didn't think the scripts... They, the one thing they said to me, Dem is never cosy, we'll not be cosy. And what happened was they changed producers and the minute the first thing he does is he's, he's making toast for his family and he's making cups of tea and they bring a wife in for him. Well, <laughs> I think they'd lost their plot, lost their way. Um... Yeah, but they've got rid of the Watts family completely. Uh, but I think the way EastEnders is going, there's a new producer in now. And I was asked to do something for the 25th anniversary, which uh, uh, was great. And, and every now and again, they always ask me to come out and comment on stuff. So and their viewing figures, I gather, go up when that happens. Um, it's They've got this new producer from Hollyoaks. And... I, and I'm not, and they, I just heard uh, on the radio the other day that they've cut, axed about eight members of the cast or they're getting rid of them. Um, and it, I think maybe it might go the way of Hollyoaks. It might go with a lot of youngsters in it, which is, is, is I think, Julia Smith might be looking down and saying no. Uh, but no, when I went back, every time I go back, the, all the crew come out of their way to see me. And when we were for the 20th, I didn't hang around to the party long because I was rehearsing the next day. All the crew and the producers and a lot of the actors, all the old, even the people I've never met, will go, oh, what a meet you, lovely. So, yeah, if I went back, I'd have to go back to my long-lost twin brother, wouldn't I? Yes, you would. So, Dad's Army, Private Walk with this Biv. What a part for you, eh? Brilliant. <laughs> uh, very hard for me to play it. Yes. This Biv, but um, <laughs> I've been very lucky. It's one of those parts that uh, it's it's a joy to play. It's a joy to be in. It's... it's Great uh, again, another of those iconic uh, television programs, and and I'm not um, 
uh, you know, again, sound, trying to sound big headed, but I've had the you know wonderful accolade from Jimmy Perry and David Croft. You know, they've said it on television, they've said it in the press, and they've said it in the program that I am Walker, and um, and uh, yeah, which is great to hear. But I was very lucky because you know what a what a hard act to follow James Beck, who sadly, though one of the youngest in Dad's army, was one of the first to die. I mean, all my career I've been very, very lucky. So one day it's going to come to an end, but by then I hopefully I'll be living by the seaside and, you know, with a... In, in a, Eastbourne. On a, on a mobility scooter, we go faster stripes. <laughs> oh, Worthing, if it's in mobility, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Leslie Grant, it was always a pleasure to talk to you. And you, John. I find you one of the nice guys and uh, you, you chat and it's lovely just always to chat to you. Brilliant. Well, I hope you enjoy the, uh, you know, the rest of the... I'm year. looking forward to seeing you this afternoon, actually. Brilliant. It's great, he's got a swell personality He meets and greets the stars with such amenity Good enough to make you coming out of the street John Hannah me That's right Happy memories there of an interview I did in 2008 in Eastbourne with the late Leslie Grantham who sadly died in June 2018 I interviewed Leslie several times during his life and found him a perfect gentleman, always pleased to see you, and whenever you got into his dressing room, it was just a delight, and he was so kind. On the very last occasion I interviewed him in Eastbourne, actually he asked me to come around after the show, we'd done the interview before the show, and he said, come round afterwards and we can have our picture taken and I'll keep on my costume. He was in Dad's army at the time, and so there we were, and we had our photograph taken, and it was the very last time I ever saw him. I love white, radio. 